I'm going to send an ambulance. I need to make sure before I let you off the phone, he's breathing. Is he breathing? Yes, but he's really struggling. We'll be right there. He can hear me. <gasps> and I, just the grace of God woke me up and I could hear them. And you know, can you breathe? And he's trying to put the mask on him. I could not move. I could not move. And I could just hear a voice somewhere in me just saying, get up. You know, get up, go check on him, make sure he's okay. The fever ray is broke. And when right. I came here, the nurse was like, ma'am, this is Asthma is one of the country's most common and costly diseases. An estimated 20 million Americans suffer with asthma. That's one in 15 Americans. A great majority of them are children. The good news, with proper management, most kids can live active and healthy lives. The bad news, not enough people understand how serious this disease can be. Oh, the night he had to be intubated. Very scary. That was the, that was the worst. Sean, Sean just crashes out. He'll look like he's doing better. And at the time when you check him, you give him his medicine, you give him his peak flows. Before he goes to bed, they'll seem okay. And then just in the middle of the night, he crashed out around 11. Luckily, Christian Hospital EMS workers were quick to arrive. When we got on scene, our fire alarm then told us that the patient was now not breathing. But we had a fire truck dispatched and we went inside. We did our stuff inside. We had help arrive. They helped us get him out to the truck. We got him tubed or intubated and we got him down to Children's where they had the team waiting for us at the doors. They were angels sent from heaven. That's what they were. Save my boy. Sean Mills was born weighing just two pounds, four ounces. Because of his underdeveloped lungs, he remained on oxygen for the first three years of his life. Sean is, uh, is a very engaging young man. He uh, was very premature and uh, Probably some of his lung disease is a result of that prematurity. But he, he clearly has asthma. I mean, I call asthma. Dr. Robert Strunk is one of the top pulmonary allergy specialists in the country. He practices at St. Louis Children's Hospital, which was named number seven on the list of America's best children's hospitals by U.S. News and World Report in 2010. He has seen Sean for some time and says he's very lucky to be alive. But it was really the the parents knowing that he was sick and paying attention, um, him probably asking for help because I'm pretty sure he knows when he's sick and he asks, and then the rapid response. Sean is now 14, and like most other young men, he seems to love sports and is quite good at wrestling. A poster on the wall in his bedroom keeps him positive and it just tells you to persevere. You know, don't worry about what other people say. I can tell them it's not how you start the game, it's how you finish. You know, just do your best, that's all I ask of you. Do your best. However, the day we were with Sean, his pulmonary lung function test results were not so good. Taking care of asthma is very difficult because it requires knowing about symptoms, it requires knowing what the medicines are, the technology is, is difficult because there's always another technique for a puffer or just an aerochamber spacer or a nebulizer, different kinds of medicines with different delivery systems. 
Dr. Leonard McCarrier is an associate professor of pediatrics at Washington University School of Medicine and Children's Hospital. He agrees that treating asthma is difficult, but essential. We take asthma very seriously um, here and really have a, a program that we believe is nationally and internationally recognized for the work that many people have put in over the last 15 years to get us here. Between five and 6,000 kids will come through Children's Pediatric Asthma Clinic in a single year. Nurse practitioner Ann Boardmeyer will see many of them. When a child's in the hospital, um, it's really important that we coordinate with that primary care provider because for us to come up with some plan that we think is just great, send the kid home with that plan, and if we don't communicate with that primary care provider and they're not on board with that, well, we're gonna be sabotaged because the primary care provider is really where asthma care should be housed. The plan that Ann is referring to is the color-coded asthma action plan, which she says is key. The action plan is the one place where on one piece of paper, we've got what do you do all the time? How do you recognize when your child's first starting to get sick? And then what do you do when they're really in a crisis? Filled out by the provider, the Asthma Action Plan contains the type of medication the child is on and what to do in a green, yellow, or red situation. On a green day, your asthma is manageable, a yellow day, you're having some symptoms, and a red day means see a doctor or call 911. Anne had a patient that morning whose family missed all those signs. I was in to see Tati this, this morning, and she's a toddler who has had four kind of significant episodes. She is a little more serious admission than some of the admissions that we get, but I couldn't really help that child because the grandma wasn't using the inhaler in the chamber right, and she, she said that to me this morning. She said, oh my gosh, I just really learned a lot. I wasn't, I probably wasn't giving her any medicine. So you can see how that child would really uh, be um, at a loss if the parent or the grandparent wasn't able to give the medicine correctly. Asthma-related hospitalization charges alone total over $50 million each year in Missouri. Although it's a common reason for emergency room visits, much of the cost is avoidable. Take a deep breath for me. <gasps> and blow it out. Good job, again. <sighs> Unfortunately, we see a lot um, of kids with asthma, and it's probably our single most um, frequent uh, diagnosis for kids coming to the emergency room. Dr. D. Hodge specializes in pediatric emergency medicine and says about 50% of the hospital admissions come through the emergency room at Children's. And we see some kids who are in six, seven, eight times a year with their acute asthma attacks. That's a child where somewhere in the system we're failing this child. Matt Steiner is an epidemiologist with the St. Louis City Department of Health and had some disturbing statistics to show us. That pie right there represents, since 1994, the amount of visits to the emergency room for St. Louis City residents for broken arms and legs. Just kind of your average run-of-the-mill emergency room visit. The chart here represents emergency room visits for asthma. Again, the colors represent the different racial groups, the green being African-American and the blue being Caucasian. So you can see that not only are there large amounts of asthma visits um, to the emergency room, but the racial disparity is much more distinct for asthma. According to Matt, there are no real racial predispositions genetically linked to asthma. However, what we do see is we do see a larger segment of our African-American population living in poor socioeconomic conditions which can affect their health in a lot of ways. Children in the city of St. Louis suffer a disproportionate burden of asthma. Estimates are 20 to 25 percent of St. Louis city children have asthma, and therefore that is well above what the national estimate is of about 8 to 10 percent. So the rate of asthma in St. Louis city is about three times that, the national average. It was definitely on Adrian's mind the day we spoke. And I wanted to how do poor people get their medicine? They gotta choose whether to eat or feed their other kids. 
some shine medicines almost 300 bucks without insurance. I couldn't imagine. My biggest challenge is to help solve that problem of access to care and getting the care improved in uh, the underserved, the inner city, the urban areas. Patricia Washington is a board member for the St. Louis Regional Asthma Consortium and believes a lot of the problem is economics. You have uh, families living in older homes, they live in urban environments where they are uh, still subjected to lead paint. They are subjected to a lot of different triggers that, you know, if they were living in a more well-to-do environment, they would not have some of those uh, challenges. But because they don't have the ability to leave their environment or improve their environment many times, that's why you'll find that you'll see so, so many of them diagnosed and with repeat visits to the ER re that they can't manage very well. Patricia has her own story about how asthma has touched her life, beginning with the loss of her childhood friend. I was five years old, um, and I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, and I remember trying to wake him up, and I thought he was, we were going to play. And I kept shaking, and, and he didn't wake up. And so I ran next door, and I got my mom and my grandmother, and uh, they came over and it was too late. He, he had, had an asthma attack and died. She never imagined that her own son would be diagnosed with asthma at age two. When Victor was first diagnosed, I was terrified. It all came flooding back to me that day, that sunny afternoon, finding my friend on the floor. And in an instant, it almost, I almost resigned myself that that was gonna be my child's fate. Um, because I didn't know any better. Uh, so I had to move from this place of fear um, to empowerment. And it was only through education and research and reading was I able to go from fear to confidence and understanding. Cut this while I'm Which doing is this. just what she has instilled in her now 16-year-old son. Victor, now a sophomore at McClure High School, is an award-winning basketball player. He's also an aspiring songwriter with his first CD. But life has not always been without its challenges. I thought I really was going to die. I was on the basketball court, and I had just gone up for a shot. And as soon as I came down, I just couldn't breathe. Like the air just came from out under me, and I just couldn't breathe. When I saw him on the floor, everything just triggered in my mind. Everything triggered from being five years old, um, seeing my friend on the floor, watching my child on the floor. Uh, I knew immediately he had not taken his, his inhaler. It was terrifying. And that actually turned out to be a good thing for us because in the end, it helped me help him understand you're not weak when you tell people you have to come out of the game. He also now understands that having asthma is nothing to be ashamed of. When he was younger, he used to hide. I hid like that because I was embarrassed. I didn't want people to see me like this because I had a, a reputation of just having fun. And uh, so I was just really embarrassed. For Dr. Strunk, that behavior is not uncommon, but it can lead to tragedy. But I remember um, an 18 year old boy who had bad asthma and he just got worse and worse and uh, stayed in his room more and more. And his, his parents didn't even know how sick he was and then by the time he called for help it was too late. Victor is creating his own foundation to provide asthma education for teens and their families hoping that these kind of things won't happen. I wish we could do better with psychological problems. I mean I've spent a whole career working with families and understanding where they are and helping them through their issues and it's not always possible to get them there. It affects the parents because they don't get as much sleep, they miss work, they're worried. It affects the siblings because the one with asthma gets more attention and the normal sibling feels left out and all of that spirals unless it's understood and inter intervened with. Well, I think that, uh, I 
I just uh, got off the telephone. Dr. Philip Kornblatt was one of the first to recognize the psychosocial aspects that come with the disease. He believed more focus should be placed on patient concerns. We are what we are. And um, if there are things that you're concerned about, such as I'm going to die from asthma, and no one knows that, and you don't have an opportunity to express that concern, then it can't be addressed. He and Dr. Ray Slavin were instrumental in starting the local chapter of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America almost 20 years ago. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation is the only uh, national organization that concerns itself with the problems of asthma and allergic diseases. And it, it's particularly uh, relevant because in the last 10 years there's been a striking increase in asthma and allergic diseases. Each year, adults miss close to 15 million days of work due to asthma, and children, more than 14 million days of school. It is the fourth leading cause of work absenteeism and the leading cause of school absence. In recent years, more focus has been placed on asthma care, and more organizations have joined forces to help make a difference. Katrina Chambers is with the St. Louis Regional Asthma Consortium and has been working on a grant-funded program through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention called AMARC, Asthma Management for At-Risk Children. Our program came along to say, let's form this partnership that's continuous and where we're all talking, we're sharing resources, and we're getting families involved in communication. We're getting doctors involved in communication with the school systems. We're getting schools involved with talking to the doctors and the families. So you have this triangulation of communication between the doctors, the schools, and families to improve asthma outcomes across the board. The structure of the AMARC grant consists of the consortium subcontractors, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the St. Louis College of Pharmacy, and the St. Louis-led Prevention Coalition. Their partnerships include the Institute for Family Medicine, Healthy Kids Express, and the Asthma-Friendly St. Louis Program with the St. Louis City Department of Health. The goal of AMARC is to create an asthma infrastructure within the St. Louis region. Ideally, creating these partnerships will reduce the gaps between those affected by asthma and the knowledge and services that are provided to this population. At every AMARC meeting, they discuss what each subcontractor has done the past month to ensure they're on track with educating the community. Dr. William Kincaid, who chairs the consortium, played a major role in helping to obtain the AMARC grant. I think that fits into the whole message we're trying to get out, which is educate patients every place that you have an opportunity to do that. I love Dr. Kincaid. He is so passionate about this. There, there's no just going through the motions for him. I mean, he is at the power of 10 the whole time. And it just takes one encounter with him to understand that this thing is not insurmountable. I mean, we can really make a difference. Brandy Mays, who has asthma herself, feels that together they have made a difference. She oversees the St. Louis City Department of Health program, Asthma Friendly St. Louis. The Asthma Friendly St. Louis program is funded by a grant through the Missouri Foundation for Health, and it's a grant that links the child with asthma, their provider, and the school that they attend. And the program is great, it's easy to enroll, and it's absolutely free. And we have quite a few resources to offer children, including the home assessment workbook, we have a HIPAA vacuum loan program, and also, of course, asthma education. To get some input on the home assessment workbook, the asthma friendly team held a focus group. We were excited to get families together to talk a little bit about asthma and it was really wonderful to see fathers taking a vested interest in the health and wellness of their children and they'll be sort of our advocacy parent group through the life of our grant and hopefully beyond the grant to help us to really get the word out in their own respective communities about asthma. The Missouri Foundation for Health has helped fund three asthma projects in St. Louis, totaling $1.7 million. The current project is a COM grant with the St. Louis City Department of Health. Dr. James Kimmy runs the foundation and feels strongly about the environmental aspects involved with asthma. Secondhand smoke, big, big problem. Uh, with the, you know, the kids are there, they're predisposed for one reason or another, uh, or they have asthma uh, already 
and the smoke is uh, it, it's uh, toxic for them. I think that people are starting to understand a little bit more the relationship between smoke and secondhand smoke, and even now we consider thirdhand smoke to asthma. But I don't think that there's enough education that helps parents to understand that it really does have an effect on their children. But right now our work has been with communities and trying to get communities to go one by one. And we've got the county, we've got the city, we've got a number of other municipalities in Missouri that have gone ahead and gone smoke free. It's serving as a filter, so there's contaminants in the air and it's going under this door and it's being filtered out. We also have healthy housing specialists that are certified now here at the health department that can assist you with housing assessments if you so choose. And the healthy homes component, we really want families to know there are things that you can do at home to also reduce the exposure to allergies and to triggers within the home like some are dust mites, washing linen, putting teddy bears in the freezer or in the dryer to kill off some of the dust mites, eliminating smoking in the home, or not smoking at all. And of course, we can't forget our furry friends. Unfortunately, pets can also be a trigger for children with asthma, and spreading the word about all of these triggers is extremely important. The Asthma Consortium has really been key in tying together agencies and universities and other agencies that are working to care for asthma in the city of St. Louis. They have quite a bit of resources and we work with them to put on different events and we have quite a few different partnerships. One of those events was a fun and educational day for elementary students. At Jefferson Field Day we were able to engage a lot of our partners to help kids better by using demonstrations, and kids are very visual, they like to touch things and see things. We're able to use the hula hoops and show how someone who might have asthma could still be physically active and have asthma. So each station was something different. There was a game where the kids could use straws to blow the cotton balls and understand how we exhale air from our lungs. We were able to get some pig lungs, they're actual pig lungs that have been preserved, which they did have some tar effects on them. The purpose was to show how smoking would age lungs over a period of time and they were pretty knowledgeable and excited to learn about those things. One station they even made mucus, which was kind of gross, but it helped the kids to understand how our lungs produ produce mucus. That day the kids also learned the correct way to use their inhalers with their spacers. We want it in the airways, so you're going to put it in your spacer. And there's different spacers, aren't there? Yeah. You put it in here and then you put your mouth on it. We really want to encourage kids to connect the inhaler and the spacer together and just kind of use them as one tool because without it, the medication does not deliver to the lungs as effectively. Cardinal Glennon pharmacist Lisa Loops agrees. So pharmacists are allowed to become as asthma educators, which I have taken on that training. And so then I try to convey that to the patients and the residents, physicians that I work with on definitely understanding the role of asthma medication. And I, think, and I think the pharmacist, whether it's at Walgreens, Shop and Save, here needs to show the families how to use their inhalers correctly. Former school nurse herself, Rochelle Clark, now manager of health services for the St. Louis Public Schools, is very pleased to see how partnerships are making a difference in the classroom. Because of our also wonderful relationship with the Healthy Kids Express, from St. Louis Children's Hospital, from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation, from the Asthma Consortium. All of those entities help us keep nebulizers in every school, medication in the school to use, EpiPens to use, as well as some years we've had generic inhalers to use for children. Last year alone, the Healthy Kids program gave out 2,200 flu shots in the St. Louis area. Pediatric nurse practitioner Lisa Meadows manages the program and talks about why it's unique. We bring a mobile van and we partner with several schools or districts and we provide them um, education and then we bring the kids out to actually do exams and manage their asthma. If I would say what is different about the Healthy Kids Express, first it would be that it's like a mobile doctor's office on wheels. Uh, we're equipped just like a specialist is. All the children that are enrolled in our program have to go through asthma classes. 
We try to incorporate, we know that kids are so electronically savvy these days, so we try to stay up with the times and purchase things that will engage them. So the children would answer questions um, and use, it's almost like a game pad, uh, and that game pad uh, scores all their tests for us. As part of our program, we supply the medicine bag that the children label with their own names and included is a peak flow meter, an arrow chamber, and whatever medicine. They get two sets of those bags because it's not only important for them to have it at school where they're spending a majority of time, but at home too. According to Lisa, they continue to see nearly an 18% increase on average with student knowledge and as much as a 20 to 30% decrease in absenteeism. But she says there's much more that can be done. One person or one organization just can't do it alone. It takes a, several people to build a village and the same thing holds through with asthma care in our community. I think that our biggest challenge is education and dispelling myths about asthma. Patricia not only agrees, but still gets upset just talking about it. There are kids dying every day because they're not taking their medicines. They're not taking their medicines properly. Their parents believe, oh, give them some Robitussin and it'll be okay. They'll grow out of it, give them a cold shower. Um, I'm sorry. Robitussin doesn't cure asthma. Cold showers don't prevent asthma attacks. And so people are dying still. And it's 2011. That asthma attack or pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Dr. Hodge has lost more than one child to asthma over his career. He says it still affects him just as much. Especially um, when you find out that it's a child who's been sick at home for a number of hours and the parents either didn't recognize it or were trying to manage it at home and again just didn't understand how severe the problem is and what can happen if not treated appropriately. I think that it's very important to not be blasé about an asthma attack. All of these children, every one of them has had a bad attack and they've all pulled through. And parents think, well, this is just another bad attack. If I do what I've done before, it'll be fine. And then it gets worse and pretty soon they're caught off guard and the child is dead. It's unfortunate when any child has to experience these symptoms. I, I feel better that what we have available to us now in 2011 are really good medicines, really effective and really safe medicines. And if we use them correctly, they work. And these children do much, much better. So I know we can improve their lives and we can improve their functioning and we can markedly decrease their risk of having a very dangerous asthma episode. We've come a, a, a long ways you know, from, from our initial beginning. Uh, there's still much to be done. I think that, that the answers are coming. Uh, we have better medicines and they're going to be better tomorrow than they are today. Uh, we're going to have better answers. We're going to have better answers about the environment and environmental control measures. Uh, and what people can do for themselves. At the 2011 Asthma Summit in St. Louis, Dr. Kincaid spoke about what's been accomplished and the future going forward. I think the real issues now are making sure that the work that we've done to show that things are effective, that those things now get paid for. You know, we had funds from outside sources from the Missouri Foundation for Health and from the Centers for Disease Control to look at educating in schools, to doing some of these innovative things that will help educate people. And we've measured to show that those things actually work. The trouble is that funding goes away, the research uh, studies go away. Now we need to change the system. The healthcare system needs to be more responsible for taking a look at these uh, terrible asthma statistics and acting on them and making our system improve. In the meantime, the carrier says we shouldn't lose sight of one important fact. You can have asthma and be a pretty fine athlete. 
and do anything you want to do. You are not going to be a scuba diver. You are not going to be an Air Force pilot if you have substantial asthma. Other than that, all bets are on. You can do anything else there is, including going and winning an Olympic gold medal. Aim sliding school. I bet this is fun. Adrian and Sean have gone on with their lives, and Adrian says she's handling it all like she always has. You can't dwell on it. You got to keep it moving. Sean got out of the hospital and he got his rest. He was back to doing his activities. Back to his bowling, his wrestling, his roller skating, his karate. I'm going to tell you, I was standing in that hallway. I'm like, no, oh God, you gave him to me. You can't have him back. So my faith keeps me going. As far as Victor and Patricia, perhaps she doing, says please. it best. I was not supposed to have children. My doctors told me I would never have children. So sometimes I think about it and I say, well, not only do I have a child, but I have a child who has asthma, who made me confront one of my worst nightmares, one of my worst fears. So he's here for a reason. And I think this is just perfect for us. For additional information about asthma, you can contact the St. Louis Regional Asthma Consortium 3545 Lafayette Avenue, Suite 372, St. Louis, Missouri, 63104, or go online at www.asthma-stlouis.org.